Eric, it's wonderful to welcome you here to Penn State. And thank you. Thank you for coming in as a Coil Fisher speaker for us. Um, one of the things we do when we have uh, individuals come in to talk us, uh, with us on a variety of topics is to ask them uh, three questions. And, and we're using these three same questions so that we're able to look at over time and over expert uh, domains the different responses. We call it COIL perspectives. So I've prepped you a little bit with our questions, but I'll give them to you again just sure. to sort of plant the seed. And we'd love your reflections on those. The first is um, thinking out in a relatively short time and whether three to five years is short or long depends on your perspective. But that's the window, like, like still doable within um, uh, a time frame where we might see output, but not too far out where it's too futuristic. And um, we'd like you to think about that time frame and maybe describe where you think we're going. What might we be seeing in a three to five win year window? The second question is, with that perspective, um, what might be the barriers that you see that will prevent us from reaching that kind of a, of a vision? Uh, and the third question has to do with leadership. And that is, what do we as university um, faculty members, instructional designers, all of us, us that influence or can influence our learning space, how should we be thinking about moving into that space? What do we have to do to get there? So. Sure. If it's okay, I'd start with the first one. What do you see as three to five years out is maybe that uh, emerging learning space? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose as sort of a, a CEO of a couple of ed tech startups, I'm supposed to talk about, you know, huge visions and disruption, right? Right, um, right, right. Uh, but, but, I, I, but I don't, and I won't. Um, I, I think in three to five years, uh, it won't surprise you uh, to hear that I think m one of the frontiers that I think will begin to assert its influence in, in higher education is the um, collection and the use of data um, to become a more, to, to, to enable us to take more scientific approaches to education. Um, I think that there's a, uh, a mindset, and we'll get to this later when we talk about barriers, mm -hmm. um, that, that education is an art. And there is unquestionably art in education. Um, but there's also a lot of known science, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, I think, knowable things um, that we could know if we start to think about um, data and what are the valuable types of data that we can gather, what can we learn from it, and really importantly, what kinds of questions can we answer through data? Um, so I think what we're going to see in five years is not wholesale change in education based on, you know, big data um, uh, like we saw it maybe in retail. Um, right. Retail set up for that. This, the educate, higher ed is not retail for a million reasons. But I think we will see institutions that are um, highly effective practitioners of, of data, that are demonstrating uh, better learning outcomes, uh, demonstrating cost efficiencies, um, and making smart decisions about when they're saving the, that money, let's say, on the instructional side, and they're actually achieving better outcomes with lower costs, applying it to places like um, heavier investment in research to get excellence in a new research area they want to get. So that the whole picture to the rest of the world is you can actually use data, you can drive better learning outcomes, you can make better decisions, um, and you can free up dollars to do other to pursue other institutional strategies. So will its effect be massive and disruptive? No, but I think we'll have mainstream um, large universities becoming stronger practitioners of data, seeing a data culture begin to permeate beyond the marketing departments mm -hmm. um, uh, and into uh, schools, colleges, um, be able to start to see um, bodies of faculty who are champions of this because they recognize that this is providing us with insights into our students, insights into our own practice that we never had before. It's not threatening. It's actually quite valuable. Uh, and so we'll see, I think, in three to five years, really strong exemplars that will begin to assert uh, an influence uh, on, the, on the institution or the academy. And, and I think the real time frame for change based on data is probably 15 years. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I think we'll see real pockets, a movement, of, a movement real pockets of movement and real so evidence. Something you said kind of triggered another thought in my mind, and that was the relationship between the art and the science. In this case, I think you're describing that the data, the science, uh, that we can measure, observe, can begin to influence the art. Yes. And, and, and for a faculty member, that would make me very excited because that it, it is both science and art that I do. So you're not saying it's one or the other. No, that's it's, right. I think the only value of the science is ultimately 
as it affects the art. Yeah. Um, and, and, and really, or maybe I shouldn't say that, but I think it's a huge part of the value of the mm -hmm. science. And ultimately, it's the art and the science in service of what better learning outcomes. Can we educate yeah. more students? Can we do it more robustly with better outcomes than we could do it with no more resources than we spend today? And I think it, you can only do that when you're able to collect data, mm -hmm. model data, but then have the data influence the art. Yeah. So not drive or take it over, but, but inform it. Correct. Um, I, I like the idea that as educators, the intuition of what we do informs the art as well. And it's how we interpret that data to make the changes we need to. So, right. But so, it be, you know, I'm just sorry to cut in. That's just okay. on this, this word of intuition, it's such a great example. Um, uh, we all have intuitions, and many times they're highly valuable, mm -hmm. and many times they're very invaluable. Uh, or I shouldn't say that they're 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 obstructionist, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and and a good example of that, you know, the the, the in the parlance of of learning science, it's mm -hmm. this idea that um, that you can have expert blind spots. The more expertise you have, mm -hmm. sometimes the harder it is for you to recognize where a novice learner might not know what you know. Mm -hmm. You just assume a certain level of of knowledge and ability to absorb. Mm -hmm. So it's actually you know, the more expert you get, and faculty in the United States of America are amongst the most expert in their fields of anybody in the world, they have some deep blind spots. So they have an intuition that's actually um, uh, incorrect, and, and therefore they're not recognizing where their students aren't able to absorb. And all of a sudden, sometimes data is shocking to them. Mm -hmm. But in a good way, they say, I've been doing this for 15 years. I always thought they understood that's that. Right. I can see that they don't. Yeah. And, and, that, and so it can become very valuable. Interesting. So um, I, I like that perspective, um, and, and I agree with this framework uh, that you're providing, uh, and I'm wondering what's going to inhibit us from reaching that. What are the issues that we may have to address in higher education or is education as a whole in order to achieve that kind of a vision? Yeah, you know, I, I think that um, some of them are um, <clears throat> cultural, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this, you've, you've hit on one, right, which is this, this a fear mm -hmm. that um, this is somehow you know, implementing science, gathering data in the teaching process is somehow really in the end about, you know, replacing faculty right. um, as opposed to enhancing the practice and, and what faculty are able to do, allow them to do it in less time than, than is required for them to do it today, um, and to free up time to, for them to do other high value activities. Um, the, um, so there's cultural issues, and I, 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 but I also think there's a, a real issue uh, I see it frequently in higher education, which is um, trying to solve uh, too many problems mm -hmm. too quickly, and therefore solving nothing and then abandoning ship after a little mm -hmm. while. Um, so, so when I think about this question mm -hmm. of data, for example, um, I, I think it's frequently the case that people have a, a, a view that, oh, okay, so what's this whole thing about data analytics and education about? It's about we have a lot of data. It's in our SIS. It's in our CMS. It's in our LMS. It's in our, our CRM. Um, it's, and so what we need to do is find a way to pipeline all that data to a big common store, hire 20 data scientists to start doing predictive modeling, and then cross our fingers and hope that we find some insights in there um, that drive better outcomes at the university in some way, shape, or form. That, that's a recipe for failure. There's going to be seven committees involved, a lot of time to get there, a lot of money, and, an un, and, 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 and the question is, what questions are you actually trying to answer? Yeah. So I think the other problem is we don't have a, sometimes we don't have the right mindset mm -hmm. in higher ed that says, what, what questions are we trying to answer? What data could we gather mm -hmm. that would allow us to answer those questions? And before we even do that, we have to ask ourselves, if we got the answers to that question, are we willing to organize a different mm -hmm. solution to it? And can we do it in some constrained places? Mm -hmm and try to solve some problems and, and do that in three months and solve it and then say, okay, great, let's try that on a different question with maybe some bigger implications. So, so there's a culture of inaction that's, yeah. that's not, mm. it's, it's not nefarious. Mm. Um, it's actually, there's a strong motivation to act and to solve, but, but almost too big. Yeah, almost, um, what I hear you saying is a bit of an undisciplined approach to let's do everything, cast the net very wide and hope we and therefore we scare a lot of different people who then need to right. have a say rightfully right. so right. and therefore it's hard to move yeah. forward i really like the idea of focusing in on the uh, uh and agreeing to which is in itself not an easy thing to do the question what is right. the issue that we have to address right 
So um, it's great setups, and, and it goes into the third question about leadership. So what do we do as, as administrators, as, as faculty leaders, to set up an environment where we can begin to move toward perhaps a more disciplined, structured uh, future? Sure. Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess the first thing is um, uh, I, I think a real commitment to something that I think everyone can agree on. So for example, you know, are we, are we trying to, or at least most people can agree on, right? Mm -hmm. so, so do we have a commitment to finding those things that, that we're going to try to solve where there's shared agreement that we should try to solve them? Mm -hmm. um, so let's take uh, student learning outcomes. Let's mm -hmm. say, can we, can we actually um, expand the number of learners in our institution? Um, uh, can we spend less money to educate mm -hmm. them? But can we do that in a way that we can prove the education is at least as robust as it used to be. Right. And, and, and so mm -hmm. if that's a valuable goal, mm -hmm. then I think there has to be real clear identification of, of what we talked about in the session earlier. What are the elephants in the room? Mm -hmm. And let's have an honest dialogue about that. Because I think if you just did that first part and you didn't do the second part right. about saying, okay, so who's scared of this? Why are right. you scared of it? Right. And, and, and have some real commitment to what we're going to do and mm -hmm. what we're not going to do. Mm -hmm before we start to dive into these things, then I think you can get alignment among stakeholders and, and say, okay, we're, we're gonna try this. And then to try it, and again, in the third way, to have a uh, uh, let's try it and prove it and do it quickly and inexpensively mentality before we escalate sure. it to a big initiative. I think So I think if mm -hmm. you sort of say, what are the issues where we have shared interests? Mm -hmm. can, we, um, uh, can we really explicitly identify the places where we, sh where we have common interests and where we don't, and then agree on what we are and aren't going to do where we have right. non-aligned interests right. before we do it, and then go solve a couple of specific problems. I, I, I like that approach um, that, that speaks to the issue that when you address the elephant in the room, you dismiss the, the pieces that may come up other, you know, you'll go down your research project, it not addressing a, a specific fear or concern, only to have it come up later on and say, well, that's right. not valid because. Right. And so you're putting it up front yeah. and addressing it head on. Yeah, and you know, I think the other thing I'd say on this is a lot of times that this is, it's beyond a semantics or a language issue. It's a, it's a lack of um, empathy issue. And, and I don't mean empathy in the, in the sort of, you know, just I empathize with you, but I, did I really understand your issues? And sometimes I think we're trying to solve the same problem but, but different stakeholders use different words or express different goals, which could actually, there could be common ground. So for example, you know, frequently a, a, maybe an administrator says, we have a goal of um, graduating more learners from our institution in a shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. And a faculty member might hear that and hear, we're going to dumb down the program. Now that's not what the administrator right. said. It may not even be what they meant, but that's what's interpreted. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and the administrator is going to the, the faculty and said, that's what we need to do. And meanwhile, the faculty is sort of thinking about, I, I, I need to reduce the amount of time I spend on grading things. Um, I, I, sure. I would love to be able to, uh, to get some additional uh, insights into things that will help me do my job more effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so all of a sudden, it really becomes around, can we frame these things in terms of goals that are, that are goals for both parties? Mutually and, yeah, yeah. agreeable, sure. And sure, it turns sure. out that I think a lot of you mm -hmm. know, what you might want to implement strategically to try to graduate more students more effectively could have real time-saving implications sure. for faculty and, and, and sort of um, instill in their practice things that they really want. Um, and, and, but I think it's really essential to strive to find and identify those things and use a common you know, vernacular about what you're right. trying to accomplish. So the language is critical. The language the is critical, and is it critical. starts with real true empathy about what are your yeah. issues, and then, and then getting the right language around it. Terrific. Very good. Well, thank you so much sure. for sharing that Thanks with us. Thanks for asking. That was a, a lot of fun, and uh, uh, we appreciate, again, your visit to Penn State. Sure. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Okay.